Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining from. Um, I, and good afternoon to you all and warm welcome from Kuala Lumpur uh, to this ABU ASBO World Lab Technical Workshop on DAB Plus Digital Radio. Uh, you know, the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union is excited uh, to host uh, this workshop. It is a continuation of a partnership with Arab States Broadcasting Union, ASPU, OLDAV, which was previously held as a physical event uh, before the pandemic struck in 2020. This workshop is held as a three-part webinar series for the next three days, and uh, it covers new developments in DAB plus digital radio systems. And uh, the webinar series also is centered around the business case and DAB plus technical update, DAB plus system features, head and systems, transmissions, DAB plus network implementation, et cetera. At this point, uh, to take you through today's agenda and presentations and some housekeeping announcement, let me invite and introduce Dr. Les Savel, who is the chair of World App APAC Technical Group. Uh, so with this, I will bring forward, uh, bring on screen Dr. Les. Uh, Dr. Les, you are on the yes. screen. I'll show over to you for the next 90 minutes or so, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sri. And welcome to all our attendees today. I see we have over 100 already, uh, which is fantastic. So you're all very welcome. Uh, and hopefully you'll get um, what you need uh in the uh in new developments for dab plus systems so there's a number of new things going on that have been going on we always advance the standard and the rollout across the globe uh each year so it's a good thing to actually provide uh some feedback uh very pleased to be working in conjunction with the abu who are hosting uh this webinar and the asbu uh, which we've done workshops with many times before. It's always a pleasure. So um, we have three days, as Shri said, um, of different topics. Today is on the business case. Um, tomorrow is on getting started. It's for, for some um, new, new starters. And um, 
And finally, we will look at how you build out the network in day three. So a lot of different topics to get through. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the program, so I won't go through that today. I'll just introduce each person as they come. But first of all, let's get some opening remarks from our hosts. Um, I think today we start with Bernie, uh, Ms. Bernie O'Neill, Project Director of World Dab. So Bernie, over to you for your opening remarks, please. Thank you, Les, and hello everyone, and welcome to this technical workshop on new developments on DAB Plus systems, mm. which uh, we're very happy to jointly organize with ABU and ASBU. So you're one of almost 300 registered delegates from over 60 countries. And whether you're already implementing DAB Plus or you're planning to conduct a demonstration broadcast, our goal with this workshop is to empower you with the knowledge and support to deploy DAB Plus in your country. So throughout the next few days, you'll not only gain technical expertise, but you'll also receive valuable information to enhance your discussions with senior management, regulators and government. And each session will include panel discussions and audience Q&A. And I would strongly encourage you to actively engage with our panel of experts and take this opportunity to ask your questions. And speaking of experts, we are honored to have 15 experienced speakers from around the world, including Australia, South Africa, Tunisia, and key DAB plus markets in Europe, UK, France, Germany, and Italy. We thank them all for their contribution. Remember that our support doesn't end with this workshop, and I invite you to consider this as the beginning of an ongoing exchange with us. World DAB offers various working groups to provide technical support, address issues related to spectrum and network implementation, receivers, cars, marketing and promotion of DAB Plus to your listeners. So I wish you a great workshop. And now for their welcome remarks, I'll pass the floor to our co-organizers, Dr. Binbay and Dr. Salhab. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, greetings, everyone from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I am really thrilled to welcome you all uh, to our exciting webinar on digital audio broadcasting today. Uh, as the Director of Technology and Innovation at the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union, ABU, I feel really honored to host this event in partnership uh, with the Arab States Broadcasting Union uh, uh, and the World AAB. Today, uh, throughout the webinar, we have a fantastic lineup of experts from the world DAB who will share their knowledge and experience, and they will explain the, the details and the advancements and its benefits and how it can change broadcasting for the better. This webinar isn't just a local event, actually, it's a global collaboration. So our partners, ESPU and World DAB, highlight the international importance of this topic. So uh, together we will dive into the latest advancements and practical tips and real life examples of DAB. So we want this to be an uh, interactive experience. So feel free to ask questions and join the discussions to, uh, and your contributions are valuable and we can all learn from each other, we think. So let's make the most of this uh, opportunity to learn and connect. Together, we will discover the potential of digital audio broadcasting and how it can shape the future of broadcasting technology. A big thank you to our partners, speakers, and all of you for making this webinar possible. Your presence ensures this event, this event will be a great success. Now, let's get started on this exciting journey of knowledge and innovation. Enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Dr. Adnan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Adnan Salhab. I'm talking from uh, the premises of the ASPO Academy in Tunis. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Arab Broadcasting Union and of its Media Training Academy, I express to you our sincere greetings and most welcome. It is our pleasure that ASPO cooperates with ABU and World Dub in conducting this online workshop about DAP Plus for the three successive days. 
I, I would like to pay tribute to my colleagues at ABU and WordUp and the noteworthy efforts that this team has made in the preparation and organization of the workshop in close coordination with the ASPO Academy team. Allow me please also to warmly greet the expert panelists at this online workshop who will greatly ensure its success. My special thanks to Dr. Les Chapel for moderating this workshop in addition to delivering his presentation in the different session. Now I would like to explore in brief the situation about the DAP plus in the Arab region. ASPO adopted the DAP plus system years ago. In the next slides, we can notice the development of implementing DAP plus in the Arab region. Uh, let me please share the, my screen. It's okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, the picture in the screen shows the progress of the DAP plus in the most of the Arab countries. Let's go to the to this uh, to some details. Uh, For Algeria, TRIA launched in 2018 and ongoing, 68% population coverage of, Alge of Algiers, planning underway to migrate from FM to DAB. In Tunisia, regular DAB Plus service launched in June 2019, 75% population coverage, multiplex of 18 radio stations on air, aiming for FM switch off by <coughs> 2025. In Saudi Arabia, the authority starting from January 2021, radio receiver, receivers are required to include the plus draft regulation applies to automotive, home and portable uh, receivers. Pilot project launched in Riyadh, Al Dammam, Al Jeddah. In Kuwait, regular the plus ser services launched in 2014, 100 population coverage, 60 the plus stations on air. In UA trial since 2014, DAP plus receiver specification published. In Bahrain trial since 2016, four services, 60% population coverage. In Oman trial launched in 2019. In Qatar trial on, on air launched in July 2019, the 10 DAP plus services on air. In Jordan trial in 2017 with five DAP plus services. Now about uh, the receivers for the Arab region, the technical committee of ASPO put forward the specification of the receivers and approved it from 2018. ASPO recommends the members to apply this specification from uh, 20, 2020. The specification which approved by ASPO meet as much as possible uh, the standard uh, the standard European requirements that respond to standards uh, HCTS 103461 and HCTS 103176 with some important expectation like with the Arab text, etc. Now about uh, the audio broadcasting uh, services in cars, in the fact uh, in the Arab region, there are no statistics which give clear view about the audio broadcasting service in cars. However, the raise of the audio broadcasting services penetration worldwide in cars in, is motivating the broadcasting uh, companies in the Arab countries to take forward steps in assurance of the uh, adequate necessary legislation to include digital broadcasting specification about among uh, all supplied to their countries such as Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, and uh, and so on. Thank you all. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Abner, for that update. And it's clear to me from from that presentation that uh, World Dab is really moving forward in the Arab states. Uh, and that's an exciting thing. It does take a long time to establish a new radio 
a digital radio broadcasting uh, system. Uh, so it's very good to see that uh, the, that good work up front. Now I'd like to echo um, the remarks of of our uh, opening remarks, particularly regarding the questions. Uh, we have a Q and A box at the bottom. Uh, please put your questions into that Q&A box and we will get to them at the Q&A session at the end um, and we'll try to answer everybody's question. So for now, though, let's move on to the first main topic and that's uh, Economics, Environment and Emergency, the Business Case for DAB Plus by our World DAB President, uh, Patrick Hannon. So Patrick, uh, please uh, uh, share your screen and... Um, Let's go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and well, I say good morning. Um, I guess for a lot of people, it's uh, good afternoon. Uh, so let me just get the screen working properly. Okay. So, um, title of this presentation Economics, Environment, and Emergencies uh, The Case for DAB. Plus. Uh, another way of putting this is the three E's. Uh, so um, this is a, a concept that uh, uh, I think is becoming increasingly important uh, to all stakeholders. Uh, so uh, to start, um, broadcast radio, as we know, offers a unique set of, of benefits. Um, it's, it offers news to local culture, it's free to air, and it's reliable in emergencies. So extremely important. Um, you know, to all aspects of society, to the broadcasters, to the listeners, uh, and, um, uh, and to civil society itself. But the world of audio is changing. Um, new digital services are being developed. Um, consumer preferences are shifting. Uh, competition is being transformed. So it's essential to have a strategy for broadcast radio. Broadcast radio, as we've seen on the previous slide, is really important. But if it's to compete in the 21st century, we need to have a new approach. And in Europe, uh, DAB Plus is really uh, established as the core of that new approach. It's uh, DAB Plus is the core future platform for radio in Europe. Uh, and just to, to explain the different colors that, you have, that we have here, uh, the countries in dark blue are markets that are now well established with DAB Plus. Uh, countries with green are markets that are on the move, uh, and then countries in light blue are countries with trials. So if we, so you can see that really sort of in Western Europe, DAB Plus is really, really established, and now it's expanding uh, further south and further east. And then it's a similar story um, in the rest of the world. Asia and Africa are now assessing the opportunity, as, as, as we've just heard, uh, in, in the Asia, in the um, Arab states, um, there's Tunisia and Kuwait are on air with, um, uh, with regular services. Uh, and then there's trials in numerous countries across the region. Um, and in the Asia Pacific region, uh, where we have Australia, which was, uh, has been on air uh, since 2009 with regular services in its major cities. And uh, we have trials in Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So a lot of interest. And the question is, what's going to happen next? Now, most of the presentations uh, over the next two or three days will be fo focusing on some of the technical features. But I, I really wanted to make sure that we understood why DAB Plus. I mean, because there's lots of things you can do with it. But the question is, why should we? Um, and at the heart of it are the listener and the broadcasters. So let's have a look at the benefits for them. So for listeners, DAB Plus offers greater choice. Um, and you can see here, uh, UK, Italy, Norway, Netherlands, and Germany. Uh, on average, there's seven times as many national services on DAB Plus as there is on FM. So a massive increase in choice. And for broadcasters, what that really means is an opportunity opportunity to innovate. Oh, really, maybe I should say opportunities to innovate. Uh, so Absolute Radio is sort of the classic example of this. Uh, on, on analog radio, there was one Absolute Radio station. But on DAB and DAB Plus, uh, we now have 10 different services, so a portfolio. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not rocket science. You know, they, you know, what they've done is 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties. 
the tens and even the twenties now, plus country music and classic rock. And the point is that they've been able to create this portfolio, which is much more tightly targeted to target to its audiences uh, than they were able to do with a single station. Um, and the net effect of that is that over the last 10 years, they have been able to triple their audience from 1.7 million to over 5 million. So massively transformed uh, their performance with listeners. Debut also offers opportunities to reach, to extend reach. So LBC was one of the first commercial radio stations in the UK, um, but it was just based in London. It was London Broadcasting uh, Company. And for 40 years, um, it was that's just what it was. It was a London radio station offering news and talk. Um, and as of 2014, it had an audience of just over 1 million. But then there, with DAB Plus, they were able to go national. And the audience today um, is now 3.3 million. So they've tripled their audience. So actually, as it happens, it's exactly the same increase in the audience as we saw for Absolute Radio. So it's really a world of opportunity that we're seeing is being uh, is being offered by DAB Plus uh, for, for the broadcasters. But DAB isn't just about the audio. Uh, it also offers uh, additional information, um, now playing information, station logos, and you can even you can even control the radio using voice 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 commands. So, uh, but the visual aspect, I think you know, that that's what we're seeing a lot of interest in it. If you ask people, you know, what do they think of of their radio? They're probably of their analog radio. They probably say they're quite happy with it. But then when you give them DAB Plus, the reaction is, oh wow, this is different. This is better. Um, and um, you know, it, it's it, things which are quite small. You know, so the, the name of the song that's playing, the logo of the station. Um, um, you know that that type of information um, just makes the the experience for the listener um, more compelling than it was before. And talking about choice, um, well, do people what do people? I mean, do people really value it? Well, the short answer is they do. Uh, in the UK, twenty two million people each week listen to services that are not available to them on analog radio. That's nearly 50% of the adult population. So people really do want this increased choice. And then I'm happy to say that it's not just about giving listeners um, more of what they want. This then is, this is translating into real commercial revenues. Um, now this, this chart here shows UK adver radio advertising revenues again over the last 10 years. And we can see that it's increased by 34%. I think you need to put that in context. This is in a situation where online advertising has absolutely exploded. So for radio to perform this strongly is really a testament to the, the strength of the brands, um, such as Absolute Radio, and the reaction of the listeners. Uh, so you know, it really does provide an opportunity for driving more, uh, for driving more income for the broadcasters. Now, I said at the beginning, that the title of this presentation was Economics, Environment and Emergencies. So let's have a little look a little, um, at this. So these are the three macro reasons for DAB Plus. Economics, uh, we've already talked about the revenue. So here we're really talking about the costs, lower distribution costs than FM. Uh, environment, we're talking about uh, energy requirements that were much lower than any other platform. And emergencies, and you're really at the heart of this, it's resilience, um, and especially for out of home audiences. So let's have a look at the economics. Um, well, the headline is, is this uh, the annual cost of broadcasters of transmitting a single service on DAB Plus is about 80% lower than it is on FM. Okay, so it's miles cheaper than it was um, uh, for, for, for analog broadcasting. And, and the reason for this is that you have multiple services on a single multiplex. Uh, so the costs are, are, are shared across different services. So that's that's been the situation actually for you know, at least at least 10 years. But the, but the, the economics are changing even further. Um, and there's a, a new technology uh, called small scale, in the UK it's called small scale DAB. Um, the, in, in a way, you don't need to worry too much about the name of the um, of the technology. The point is that it's the lowest cost approach to DAB. And it's based on open software, and that's really the key difference. Um, it's on air, has been on air for a number of years now in the UK, Switzerland, and Denmark. And the key thing about this is that 
you know, when, when it's been introduced in, in Europe, it's mainly to allow smaller local stations uh, to, you know, to, get, to come on air, uh, you know, in addition to the major, major serv larger services that, um, you know, that, have that have already been on DAB. But what, we, what we're discovering is that this provides also a, uh, provides a lower cost option for new countries outside of Europe who are contemplating how, how, how to enter the DAB market. You know, we know that for a lot of broadcasters, you know, you know, there are incremental costs involved. What we want to do is to reduce the barriers uh, to entry and small scale DAB um, you know, really offers a potential route uh, for further exploration. The second E is the environment. So the headline is this, DAB plus is the green solution. Um, uh, it consumes significantly less energy than FM um, and the BBC study which looked at both the, um, the energy consumption of distribution and also of the receivers, they found that DAB was 33% more efficient than FM. So you know, complete step change. Um, and it goes, I was, I was gonna say it goes without saying, but I will say it. Uh, and it's also uh, more efficient than IP delivery. And, you know, in, in, and in these times, uh, of uncertainty about energy prices and even the resilience of supply, uh, th those energy consumption issues are, uh, are, are of critical importance. The third E is emergencies. Um, and as I said, said earlier, the, you know, the key, one of the key benefits of DAB Plus is its resilience. Um, now, of course, that, that applies, that resilience applies to all broadcast radio. Um, but the difference with DAV Plus is the text and the images, uh, as well as the audio. Um, and in comparison, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, can't we just do this on our mobile phones? Um, there's a lot you can do on mobile phones, but particularly in times of emergencies, that's when mobile, service, uh, mobile services are less robust, um, either because uh, the, you know, the uh, networks get overloaded, um, or they may just be put out of action. Uh, it could be out of action because of uh, you know, govern governments may close down the, the local you know, the internet services. Um, it could be weather a weather event uh, that damages the local uh, the uh, the transmission. So DAB plus is much more robust uh, and therefore uh, as part of of an in, um, an emergency warning infrastructure really offers distinct benefits. Now, you'll be hearing more about this uh, later on in this session, so I won't say too much about it, but I, but I just wanted to highlight um, uh, what's happening in Germany. Uh, so Germany is proposing DAB Plus as part of its national warning infrastructure. I think historically, you know, we always knew that DAB offered potential as an emergency warning um, uh, system. But this is the first time that, a, you know, that an established uh, an established DB plus market has said, well, actually, are we going to do something about this? Uh, so the German authorities and the broadcasters uh, started discussing the role for DB plus uh, for emergencies uh, in 2021. Uh, and in September of 22, they published an official proposal, which was which has now come to to World DAB. The World DAB Technical Committee is now uh, looking at, at this proposal and with, with a view to making it internationally acceptable. I, I won't say anything more, but just to say that this is very high on World DAB's agenda, and I'll leave uh, Karsten and Andreas uh, to uh, explain uh, explain about this in more detail later on this morning. Now, this resilience of DAB Plus has been recognised by the European Union, um, and that this was this was really a game changer as far as the adoption of DAB radio uh, in Europe was concerned. Um, so in 2018, the European Union passed a mandate uh, that requires all new car radios to have digital terrestrial capability. Uh, in effect, that digital terrestrial uh, you know, in practice is DAB+. And uh, so they, and, and what drove that decision was the reliability in emergencies. And the net effect of that is that DAB Plus is now a standard feature in European cars. 96, in 2022, 96% of new cars uh, sold in, in, in the European Union and in the UK uh, came with DAB Plus as standard. Um, and what this means is that it's, there's, never been an easy, there's never been a better time for new markets to launch DAB Plus because in countries that haven't had DAB Plus, there is now 
an install base of, of cars which have got DAB plus. You know, so one of the one of the issues for broadcasters is it's a sort of chicken and egg situation. You know, if I go on air, will anybody be able to listen to my services? And historically, we uh, people had to wait for people to go and buy the radios. But now, what we're seeing in Europe is that there's there is already uh, um, an install base. You know, in countries such as Spain, for example, uh, you know, there is now an install base of cars, um, and this is really changing the whole dynamics of the situation. So, final slide uh, to su to summarise. Um, three key messages: number one, radio needs a strategy for the digital age. Um, and number two, DAB Plus is really lies at, that, at the heart of that strategy. Uh, it provides solutions for listeners, for broadcasters, and for society. Um, short to, to sum it up, now is the perfect time to commit to DAB Plus, and World DAB, as Bernie has already said, is ready to support. Uh, we want we want to welcome you on this journey, and we want to help you on this journey. Uh, I look forward uh, to. Uh, uh, working with you over the next three to five years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick, for that uh, update on business case. And I, I think it's pretty clear uh, the business case these, these days with the uh, the number of countries that are actually adopted DAB, uh, sweeping across Europe, uh, now sweeping across Arab states, and really now starting also in uh, Southeast Asia, particularly with the, uh, the work being done in Thailand, which we'll hear about a bit more tomorrow. So um, this is a technical workshop. Uh, so now we have the World DAB uh, Chairman of the Technical Committee, Lindsay Cornell from the BBC. So Lindsay, please um, let us know what's happening. Over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Les, and uh, hello to hello to everybody uh, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to join you uh, and to give you an update on what's been happening uh, in the World DAB Technical Committee. So I'm going to touch on uh, three areas: uh, receiver testing, text handling, and uh, the activities currently going on. Uh, in the, the World DAB Technical Committee. So let me start off with the receiver testing. Um, and uh, as already mentioned uh, by uh, speakers already this morning, um, there is a speci specification, an Etsy specification, um, this one here, which uh, provides the minimum requirements and the test specifications for uh, digital radio. And this specification um, is used by more or less every manufacturer around the world to uh, ensure that the products that they produce meet these minimum requirements. And of course, many receivers exceed the requirements in, in different ways, either in performance or in function terms. But this really is the baseline. Um, and this is used, as I say, throughout the world. Um, it started off as an initiative uh, in the UK, uh, the, the UK Digital Radio Tick Mark Scheme. Um, which is a scheme which applies a logo only to receivers that meet certain requirements um, and have demonstrated that they, 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 they meet those requirements past the tests. So all of that functional and performance uh, requirements are in the specification, along with the tests that you need to perform and the criteria for passing those tests. And the way the testing is done is it's split into two, two parts to make it uh, cost effective. And one applies to the chips and modules uh, that are inside every product. Um, and the other is to the product themselves, because when um, those chips and modules are put into the case, adding the display, adding the power supply, adding all the other features uh, can affect the performance. So we check for both of those things. And the reason I mentioned this split is um, will become apparent when I start talking about the next topic too. Now, <clears throat> since the uh, uh, that specification for receiver testing was originally published, which was uh, about six years ago now, there have been some updates a couple of years ago to incorporate uh, uh, small changes 
that would make the specification more international, take it outside from uh, Western Europe um, and to cover all of Europe and indeed all of the all of the globe. And one of the key areas where this this concept where this 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 change takes place um, is the idea of regional text profiles and that is to allow all the benefits of digital radio um, and uh, some of those are being able to recognize easily the station that you are tuned to uh, and simple tuning and to receive information in a textual form alongside the audio but that text needs to be conveyed in the language uh, which uh, people understand and using the scripts which people understand and for a long time DAB radios by and large only carried the Latin script so that that used for English and French and so on. <clears throat> now Patrick mentioned uh, a key piece of European legislation uh, which was the EECC um, that mandated that uh, digital radio should be fitted in new cars sold in the European Union and the European Union has a number of official languages and those official languages are not only written in Latin script but also in Greek script and in Cyrillic script um, and therefore we made a change to these minimum receiver requirements to incorporate the facility for testing with these other scripts as well as Latin. There were also some other other changes. So 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 we added the requirement for an emergency alarm announcement, and also enhanced the service following. But the main uh, the main change really was this was this addition of tests to the core technology to ensure that it would be able to react when coupled with a suitable display to text sent in other scripts than Latin. And the, 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 the way that text is actually uh, described, the way it's handled by the specification is included in this other Etsy specification, um, which defines the rules for broadcasters and receiver implementations for the complex service information features. And these features include service following when you're tracking from one uh, broadcast signal to another uh, for the announcements, for service lists, how do you arrange all the services within uh, a list that the, the user uses? How do you deal with changes to that? And also the non-Latin text. And the framework of using non-Latin text gives two things. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there's some, some signaling which tells the receiver what are the complexities of the text it's expecting to be able to handle and that enables the receiver to act in a suitable way when it doesn't know how to specifically have a, 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 a the capability to deal with something but it knows how to do something else instead it knows it should do something else instead such that um, you don't just get gobbledygook you get something sensible at all times and the regional profiles concept for the text defines the scope and the limits for any particular set of characters. So therefore, both the broadcasters and the receivers are using the same set of codes. They're using, they're, they're both speaking, if you like, the same language. So the text handling is, uh, is codified into the register tables, yet another specification. We like specifications in the technical committee. Um, we have four profiles. So we have EBU Latin, um, which is extended. It has lots and lots of accented characters for use uh, in all sorts of both European and uh, indeed African and Asian languages. Uh, we have the All Europe profile, which combines that Latin profile with Greek and Cyrillic characters. We have the profile that was developed in cooperation with the Arab States Broadcasting Union, uh, which has Arabic and Latin scripts. And we have the Thai script developed in cooperation with the Thai authorities. And in the future, additional profiles for other parts of the world, other markets in the world can be developed. And World DAB is ready and willing to uh, coordinate and cooperate with the broadcasters and the industry uh, representatives to create new profiles uh, as new markets develop 
uh, and it becomes clear um, that there is uh, a particular market to be addressed. Now let me turn to the activities, the current activities in uh, the uh, World DAB Technical Committee. So when we have new projects, we set up task forces uh, to collect together the experts to work on a particular uh, theme. Um, and one of the task forces, which has almost finished its work now, uh, is the task force SPI binary. And SPI stands for Service and Program Information. Um, and that specification consists of two parts. Uh, first of all, there's a description of metadata in XML. And the metadata that we're talking about is, for example, the in case of service information, um, are the characteristics of the service, the name, the genre, uh, and so on. But also the station logo uh, is linked to the service information through the SPI. Um, but also program information. So the schedule of programs, um, what's coming up over the next seven days, um, who are the speakers, who are the presenters, um, what kind of music is going to be uh, uh, showcased and so on. Now, this description of the metadata in XML uh, is the same for both, both broadcast and IP. It's a, a hybrid radio specification, <clears throat> and it covers a wide uh, variety of use cases. So it's not just dealing with delivering the metadata to the, uh, the consumer to the end device, but also it's used for business to business transactions. So uh, especially on the hybrid side of uh, radio, the IP side of radio, where you have a, a service that aggregates content together, very often the SPI is used to uh, exchange the metadata uh, between the content pro uh, producers and the content distributors. <clears throat> now, the second part of the specification is uh, something which uh, describes how to transport and compress so uh, it's a binary encoding specification, how to transport the metadata using uh, DAB for broadcast use. And what it does is it reduces the amount of data that's required because XML is, is, quite, uh, is quite hungry sometimes, uses lots of characters to describe something um, when actually there are only a few options and that can be represented more, uh, more, more efficiently by using uh, a lookup code. So looking at the uh, the hybrid radio, uh, we already had a mention of uh, voice control of radios um, and part of the metadata that's changed uh, m most recently in the uh, XML specification is to provide phonemes and aliases for service names <clears throat> and that enables voice assistants to use the terms that, that, the, that, that people, that listeners use rather than necessarily the, the precise text name that's written down in a, in a register somewhere. And really the work that's been going on most recently is also been a little bit in this direction of, of trying to improve the handling of metadata uh, for audiences uh, using different languages. What we find as DAB expands to new countries is that uh, we have more often the situation where there is more than one language in common use uh, in a country and therefore we need to improve the way that we give guidance of how to deal with metadata in different languages because for the same program you might describe it uh, using two different languages for example um, and therefore the device needs to know which metadata it should use according to the language choice of the uh, of the listener. So we've done, done work to straighten that out make it clearer uh, doesn't really change anything technically, uh, but it does make it easier for uh, uh, for the device implementers to understand exactly what's needed. Now, in terms of delivering the uh, SPI over broadcast radio, uh, this is the specification for that. Um, <clears throat> and we've quite extensively rewritten this specification, not in a technical sense, uh, but editorially to make it much easier to use. Um, and so it's been restructured. Um, there are clearer explanations about the encoding and decoding processes um, and the examples which help implementers to see exactly what the specification means 
um, they've been extended and brought up to date. So the last task for this task force uh, is to create a guideline document and World DAB produces several guideline documents. And in a guideline, um, you can be a little bit more, uh, re provide recommendations, uh, it reflects experience that people have had uh, rather than the more sort of dry elements of the specification, which has to be very, uh, very precise. So both of these two specifications that I've just been talking about with regards to the SBI have been approved um, by the World DAB Steering Board and are currently in the process of going through the official ETSI uh, approvals process. <clears throat> now, my last topic uh, is to talk about very briefly um, another task force which is active. Um, Patrick's already mentioned this briefly too. Um, uh, and that is that the steering board of World DAB received a request from Germany, from the Digital Radio Association in Germany, to um, assist with the international standardization for receiver testing for receivers that will be capable of reacting to an emergency warning system delivered over DAB. And the steering board has passed this task to the technical committee to deliver. Um, there are parallels in this work with some of what I was talking about earlier in terms of receiver testing specifications, we have experience of how to write those specifications such that the testing is meaningful, but the burden on manufacturers is not excessive because what we want is we want people to actually um, take the testing, to do the testing and to go in and, and get their product certified. And it'll be the technical committee defining the international standard, um, making sure that what we write is a, just as applicable uh, in any other country as it is in Germany. Um, we want to make sure that DAB standards, once they're created, can be deployed uh, throughout the world. Um, in terms of this particular scheme that's planned for Germany, it will be the German authorities who will devise uh, a, any kind of certification system similar to the UK tick mark scheme, but a different logo applying to receivers which meet the requirements of this emergency warning system. So the task force has had several web meetings. It's making good progress at uh, addressing this task, um, but that's all I'm going to say about it because there is a session, uh, a, 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 an item later on in this session, which goes into a lot of detail exactly how this um, system um, is configured, what's it for, uh, and how the progress is going on. So I shall, uh, you shall have to wait uh, for that presentation a little bit later. Um, but for now, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, there will be, as I say, um, as has been said, there's the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we will follow those up uh, as and when. Thank you very much. Back to you, Les. Thank, thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you for that update. There's uh, obviously a lot going on at the moment. Um, now it's up to me, over to me, I'm going to talk about radio distribution. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I start this, uh, with a question. Distributing radio is a broadcast IP or is it 5G? Um, there's a lot of discussion that, and particularly in, in uh, Asia, I've found a lot of talk about 5G broadcast as well. So we'll, we'll touch on that in a moment. So let's first look at um, radio distribution options. We'll compare a few methods. Uh, we'll look at some new applications and see what we conclude. So what platforms are used? In general, radio is distributed through um, FM. That's uh, uh, the Current analog method, really, AM is really waning. Uh, DAB plus, DTV, IP streaming, <clears throat> uh, and maybe 5G broadcast. So what content providers really want to do is get their content consumed. And that, that accounts for both radio broadcasters and streaming services, uh, which are the, uh, the competitor, you might say, such as Spotify, uh, Apple, and so forth. Now, we know we've got a number of different content types. 
we have live and live and linear. Uh, we have podcasts these days. We have streaming of specific content. That's uh, you dial up an album or an artist or a song. Uh, find that metadata is increasing in value, as touched on by Lindsay there, uh, and also listening consumption, listener consumption data is increasing in value. I've just got a little little graph on the right hand side here, um, which is a recent um, survey done in Australia by Commercial Radio and Audio, the Infinite, Infinite Dial Survey from this year. And it showed an increase, a massive increase in DAB listening over the last 12 months from 18% to 32%. So that is um, a really big step forward. And I, I'm really starting to wonder if this is due to the, the ever increasing number of receivers that are available to people in this country, particularly in cars. So that's good news. So let's look at those platforms uh, specifically. Well, FM, we know it's it's a legacy delivery system uh, being analog, it's basic. Uh, we get a little bit of text out of RDS if you're lucky, depends on the broadcaster. Some don't use it at all. It's expensive uh, and it's being phased out. And I was really uh, interested to hear that uh, Tunisia might be uh, doing an ASO in only a couple of years time turn their FM off and save a whole lot of money. Uh, DAB, on the other hand, is green. Uh, it's expanding and it's developing. Now, we have some other methods as well. Uh, we have DTV. Um, it's basically small consumption. Uh, it's pretty ubiquitous reception, in, in certainly in, in most uh, modern countries. Um, but it's limited to where you can actually use it, usually in a living room or some space like that. Now, IP streaming, uh, increasing use of that uh, through apps, through websites, um, and I think podcasts are actually taking some of that space as well these days uh, with increasing content types and offers. And what this is really showing is that the listeners want to have a diverse range of content to consume. Um, and I, I know this from personal experience and talking to people just in my country, Australia, that um, when podcasts really started to erupt a few years ago, that there was a bit of a rush on it because you can get different types of content. Um, that's been counted in some degree by some of the extra streaming and certainly in broadcast terms by the number of services you can receive in DAB+. Uh, we'll talk about 5G broadcast next. Um, so what's the best approach for broadcasters? You know, it, it depends a bit on what the broadcaster wants to achieve. Uh, is it increased revenue? Is it growing the audience? Is it changing the business model? Is it increased services, quality and features? Is it decreased costs? Uh, and all of the things, these things are probably of interest to the broadcasting management, but specifically will depend on the type of broadcaster. A commercial broadcaster will have a different perspective from a public service broadcaster and who will have a different perspective again from a community broadcaster. And I think one of the things that DAB really allows is that larger spread, the ability to provide more genres of music, more types of talk, uh, different discussions, more connections uh, within a medium that can be received in a mobile and a difficult environment. Um, as Patrick said, the, uh, the cost of delivering DAB versus FM is much less, um, about one fifth uh, by, you know, according to studies uh, by the EBU in particular. So that's a very good incentive to get on with it. But, uh, but it really needed end game. And we're starting to see that happening now in a number of countries. Norway went a few years ago now, Switzerland's coming on. Italy is now looking at different parts of the country with ASOs as well. Same with Germany. And now Tunisia. Uh, let's look at another method of receiving your radio content is streaming. 
Well, there's two parts to that budget. There's the mobile budget, the consumer budget. Um, in many countries, that's largely become irrelevant because uh, the cost of mobile data have reduced significantly over the last few years, but still applies in a number of developing nations. And in particular, there's uh, some of the countries in, in Asia and Africa uh, will still have very high data fees and difficult access as well, whereas broadcast is much more um, wide, uh, wide area. And of course, the data center and CDN cost for streaming. Um, DTV is used in some countries, and here's an example of the UK where approximately 3% is uh, consumed. So it's, it's there. We have it in Australia too, but not many people actually use the TV for radio. I do occasionally. Um, it can be quite useful. But um, generally, that's not the case. And we see there that uh, uh, in the UK that uh, DAB is really booming. Um, IP streaming is increasing in both domestic and mobile situations. I think the simplicity of operation has improved quite a bit, particularly in cars, but it's still a little costly. Uh, and we see uh, here an example, again, from the UK of smart speakers, about 14% uh, consumption because they're easy. Uh, my brother uses a smart speaker. He quite likes it because it's simple. He just talks to it and says, play this station. So he doesn't even have to press a button. May will be integrated into radio, broadcast radio products very soon. Um, and I'll go back to the streaming cost for a moment uh, and I'll take a, an example from the US um, where a number of US broadcasters specifically want geofencing, uh, particularly in car receivers which means that uh, the radio itself can decide in which areas it must use broadcast or can use IP. The reason for that is that broadcast is cheaper. It's cheaper than IP. You don't have to pay extra CDN costs and you don't have to pay as, many, as much for royalties because in many countries like the US and Australia, the cost of playing a song on an IP stream is typically about three times as much as it is on broadcast, depending on the volume, of course, but um, volume of plays, that is. Uh, so there are good reasons why uh, broadcast is preferred by broadcasters uh, over IP as well. Now let's turn to um, 5G broadcast. A lot, of, um, a lot of hype in that space over the last few years. Uh, mainly focused on mobile TV. But even the TV space has uh, recently been shown to be really uh, not a good solution. 5G broadcast is not a good solution for wide areas. Uh, and that is because of the robustness. And when you're receiving radio in mobile environments, whether it's in a car or it's handheld, in a bus or a train, um, you have a very difficult reception environment. That's why radio systems are designed the way they are for robust reception. Unfortunately, um, one of the integral parts of that, called time interleaving, is not included in 5G broadcast due to other parts of the standard. So it has a uh, uh, a bit of a uh, uh, a power or or signal to noise ratio issue relative to custom design systems, and there's a couple of uh, reference points here. Uh, a latest IEEE transactions on broadcasting uh, has a very good article about this in a comparison with mobile TV and ATSC, uh, and also there's a very good um, comparison and discussion in by the company called Progera in Sweden, uh, which did a study in Denmark, and I draw your attention to that as well. So uh, bottom line, uh, 5G broadcast is not being pursued as an alternative broadcast method for radio content anywhere in the world today. Uh, if you know one, please let me know, because I would really like to know. Um, let's move on a little bit. Let's go talk about applications. And I was uh, reviewing the recent 
WorldDAP Automotive Workshop, and there was a couple of papers there about sort of future of radio. And one of the ideas that was put here by Raina Beam uh, was to um, use announcements to provide additional um, content. In this case, he was using uh, a main course and a side dish, you know, a bit of a culinary example. Uh, where you can have your main course of jazz, country, electro, whatever, and have a, a number of different aspects which could pop in and out. And we know that um, DAB supports announcements and it's already got a number specified for you know, specific names. We've got news, weather, traffic, sports, finance, of course, alarm. We'll hear a bit more about that, uh, about emergency warnings in a minute. Um, but this can actually be used uh, and has been used in even FM for traffic for many years to provide uh, a sports updates and weather. And this particular example here is where someone's driving to work. They put the jazz on because they love jazz. It keeps them, keeps them uh, in a good frame of mind before work, but want to hear the sports updates, want to hear the weather updates, want to hear any warnings that might be happening. Like you know, there might be some air pollution, might be some flooding around something like that. A great idea. In fact, I talked about this myself this year. And what we did with a, the trial in Thailand is develop a domestic radio, which can have these capabilities, not just cars. It's generally announcements are usually used in cars rather than at home. But this radio, uh, which was developed with Sanjian, and Keystone Semiconductors um, in support of MBTC and Royal Thai Army, uh, we showed we can actually do all sorts of announcements and we demonstrated these in recent trials, whether it's traffic, it's warnings, it's news. And warnings in particular are quite interesting in, in, in Asian countries due to the, the smoke haze that comes in certain times of the year from forest clearing and burn off. And it can be really quite serious. So there's actually quite a practical reason why warnings would be very, very useful in home settings. It's not an emergency, but it's something you need to be aware of. So that's a good thing. Uh, the good news is that the update of this commercially uh, available radio was done in very short time at very low cost. So it's not something that's difficult to do and not something that's expensive for the radio manufacturers to implement. Um, let's think about the broadcasters bit now. And, and uh, some more slides here from the automotive workshop. It was a fantastic uh, session uh, only a month ago. And brought uh, many broadcasters are looking to have improved audience engagement. And one of the ways to do that is to understand the listening behavior of the consumer. And here's a couple of examples of how uh, two of the um, providers of services or digital services in cars uh, or hybrid services in cars, in fact, uh, Radio Player and DTS or Xperi are providing these sort of services. And we can see here the sorts of measurements that can be made, uh, time of day listening, uh, the amount of time, um, heat maps of listening, things like this give broadcasters a better understanding of their audience and maybe a better understanding of what their audience wants to hear. Now, these are actually hybrid radio solutions. They use broadcast DAB as the prime delivery method, method for the audio and some metadata like text and some images. Uh, maybe even uh, even uh, logos. So what about domestic receivers? We just saw an example how easy it is. Where are we going to go? So what do we need to do this? Well, we need a domestic radio that's got an IP connection, a graphic, a color graphic screen, and some software. Here's an example of uh, a new radio I saw at the DBS, which uh, has got a fantastic screen, a fantastic speaker, I just can't find it on the market yet. But I tell you what, when I do, I will be getting one. It looked fantastic, sounded fantastic. 
It's an example of what's called smart radio these days. Um, smart radio is where you can have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in conjunction with your DAB digital radio. So the reasons of not having hybrid radio are starting to diminish in a domestic domestic setting. So perhaps, in fact, that we'll see a convergence of a number of these devices, whether it's a radio, uh, it's a, something with a color screen, it's something with voice control and activation, they'll all merge in the future to uh, provide the ease of use, but also the lower cost of broadcast for consumers, the lower cost of energy, of course, for the planet, uh, and the lower cost for, for the broadcasters themselves. So uh, watch this space, I think, to get your rich media experience over radio. Uh, it's, uh, it's here now, but it's getting better all the time. So conclusions. Um, so broadcasters use delivery media that provides the best return for their business. So what's the answer to the original question? Distributing radio, well, it's broadcasters use the best delivery method to reach their target audience. They use DAB+, they use IP, they use mobile 5G. Now, in this context, 5G is point-to-point, -point, just like it's in 4G, it is not 5G broadcast technology. So I have been harping on this, and that's to dispel the myth, in my opinion, that 5G broadcast will be the next broadcast generation for radio. It will not. There's many technical reasons why that is not feasible. So final conclusion here, I think hybrid DAB Plus can deliver rich media experience to both cars and domestic receivers. I think embracing hybrid radio future will provide improved and more targeted services for, for consumers in both domestic and vehicles. And the ability of radio business to provide the service to attract and engage retained consumers, because by, by doing hybrid radio in a domestic setting, you get more measurements, just like we saw in vehicles. It's a way to understand your audience better. So in conclusion, it's a multimedia world. It's time for hybrid radio in all receivers. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can always get to me uh, on my web, uh, my uh, email, uh, if you wish. So now it's time for our panel session. This is a, uh, a I'm really looking forward to this. This is the emergency warning panel session, uh, which uh, is focusing on the developments in Germany, as both Patrick and Lindsay uh, uh, talked about. Now we're going to hear about from the people in Germany themselves. So I think first up is Carsten. So Carsten um, from Digital Radio Bureau in Germany, please um, please share your screen and I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and hello everyone. I do hope you see my screen now. Um, is that all right? Do you see it? Yeah, yeah, yes. please. Okay. Go on. Okay. I see, Carsten. yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Somebody said something. Wonderful. We are very happy to share that with you now. Um, there's been a lot of work put into this and lots of love and uh, we have a good reason. Now for what we do is um, I will talk about strategy and communication for a few minutes and then Andreas, he is the big star, will talk about the technical details and about receiver specifications and he'll have wonderful best cases. So why do we do warning messages via DRB Plus? Well, we want to save lives, obviously, and we want to have an extra plus like DAB plus. We want to enhance the DAB plus broadcasting system because we think in comparison, FM and DAB are not only that DAB is digital FM. No, DAB can do so much more. And it's all about the data that comes with DAB plus. So my first point is that we want to have we want to use the data we have, and with that, we want to strengthen the whole system also in comparison with other uh, systems. On point two, we want to make sure that all the emergency warnings are precise and up to date. Now that we have the data, 
obviously we can we can broadcast it in the very second which is much faster much more accurate we talked about uh, uh, texts we talked about slides we talked about color um, before that it is much more precise than only spoken warning messages via fm we want to put everything in, in standards, and we are very thankful and very happy that we collaborate with the uh, World Up and the World Up Technical Committee. There shall be international standards, Etsy and, and everything coming forth, and the TC is heavily involved. The most important thing is that as we think about MUXs and, and regions, that we had found a way to address warning messages to smaller and bigger uh, uh, regions. And Andreas will talk about that in a minute. So it's not all about the MUX and this is the warning message you get. We have it all, the, all in detail to a certain part of a city even, if you want to do that. Future raiders will be able to wake up from standby because we have, and I'll explain in a minute, we had floods that came in the night and 140 people drowned. And if we only had been able to wake up these people, tell them that you should get away from your valley and go up in, in due time. And it, you know, we didn't have that system yet. So we want to make sure that radios are able in the future to wake up from sleep and alarming people. And obviously the chip manufacturers are heavily involved in that progress. And once we have everything written down, once we have the chipsets, we have want to test everything because as uh, Lindsay Connell said, everything following the Etsy standard um, shall be tested against certain rules. So when the consumer buys a radio, he or she knows it will, div uh, it will work the way as advertised. Why Germany? Well, we have a time of crisis. I was just talking about the flood a few years ago and we have climate change in Asia and everywhere else. There's times of war in Europe. And uh, at the same time, with all of that, Germany is the biggest country regarding populations. And we love DRB Plus. So why not move forward? Germans listen to 158 minutes of radio each day. And as of now, about 30% of all the households um, can listen to a dub radio in their car, in their households. And we have sold more than 23 million DAP receivers so far in Germany. And there's 5 million new DAP receivers coming new to the market every year, which is 2.5 million for the stationary, for the home receivers, another 2.5 million for the cars, amounting to 5 million new receivers every year. So there's potential. And we use that potential in an industry alliance. As we talked about in a, a minute ago, broadcast wants to be robust. It's much more robust than other technologies. And of course, there have been and will be warning messages with mobile phones. Warning messages displayed, um, alarm announcements being broadcast with the mobile phone. But as mobile services may go down in an emergency because uh, of power failure or even the government shutting down uh, the antennas of mobile services, we want to be robust with DAP+. Plus. That means, of course, again, we strategically secure a DAB Plus system with federal and state governments because they know that they can rely on robust uh, broadcasts and that the state and the broadcasters come together at that point. And as a digital radio association in Germany, uh, we were close together with um, World Up and the TC. So this is again an industry alliance. You can read that if you want to. We have translated our system concept and management summary. It's some seven pages, just came out uh, uh, in English, if you're interested in what we're doing currently. There have been working groups. Everything, of course, is written in Germany, a very long text, 50 pages, 25 meetings with the Digital Radio Association Germany in two different working groups, network providers and broadcasters, and the technical side. and. Uh, that's what Patrick and Lindsay Cornell talked about that we came forward to the steering board of World Up. Now with timing, which is of the essence, we are currently doing very much, very many things in parallel. We are talking about standards, chips and devices. Of course, we're talking to the, uh, to the federal and state government. There shall be a warning day in September in Germany, testing what we have now, not the uh, features that will be implement, implemented in the future, that is in the future, to test what we have now. 
participants are ARD, which is a uh, regional radio, Deutschland Radio, which is my employer, which is national radio, and of course, private radio. There are coming uh, um, Etsy standards and updates from the World Technical Committee in the fall. I shall talk about marketing and logo in a minute. And in the end of the day, we do hope that we shall have marketable devices beginning of 25. So let's talk about marketing, because if the consumer doesn't know, we don't have it because, you know, chicken and egg problem. As you might imagine, warning and emergency, emergencies, they do not sell. It's who wants to buy something with a warning? You know, it's, it's, it's crisis. So warning and emergency do not sell in marketing, only under pressure. And obviously, warning and emergency don't sell at the catch register. We thought we took we take this and we do this in a new perspective. We just turn it around because we want to be a warning and emergency that we want them to become an instantaneous protective message, like an assurance, like an assistance. So the idea is if you buy that new radio, which shall be available after 25, it's like um, it's saving you. It's you, like an insurance. Uh, if you're a father and you have children or family guy, you buy this radio, you make sure that you have it. It goes on in the right time of day if there's a warning and it helps you to save your family. So we turn it into a positive message. So we want to make sure that the new logo and the new terminology shall make sure that DAB Plus is conveyed as modern and up to date. And that's uh, conveying comfort, protection, and security. And of course, I'm thinking about uh, French, uh, Spanish, also, of course, Arab-speaking countries. It shall be uh, easy to understand abroad. Um, it shall be English, and it shall be easy to understand. That's my part uh, for marketing and strategy. And now I would like to hand over to my colleague, um, Andreas. Thank you, Carsten, and for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, I would like to give you now the, the details how this system is going to work. And we have heard a lot about it uh, in various presentations today. And this is uh, this is how Germany is, is setting this up and, and bringing proposals to World DAB to um, have a specification in the end that can be implemented by receivers and the um, overall goals are basically um, this must work worldwide and it must work in a, in a receiver, in a baseline receiver. Um, <clears throat> so, hold on. Here we go. All right. Okay. My agenda, I'm, I'm, I'm quickly through it. Um, I give you a system outline. I talk a little bit about receiver requirements. I introduce very briefly a new technique that has been developed for, for this, uh, which we call geo uh, location code <clears throat> and um, a, a few words on, on the system operation. And finally, uh, ecosystem considerations. How does it come all together? Um, the system outline is basically three pillars. Uh, which which are the 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 key of this um, um, it's alert announcements that spoken message in in the audio channel that sleep and wake up for the receiver so even a receiver that is apparently in an off mode will be able to receive an alert and and wake up and play back an alert and to to bring this um, uh, to to consumers without unnecessary alerting um, there is a geofencing technique <clears throat> that allows only the receiver that is actually in the in the alert area to to wake up. Um, the alert announcements are basically a proven proven concept. You know that from from uh, DAB announcements. Um, there, there, technically that's that's a new design, but uh, the concept is exactly the same. It's, it works uh, with any receiver and it has other ensemble support. So um, all receivers uh, tuned to any ensemble that has uh, the warning system um, can, can bring play back the alert message. Additional metadata will allow the, the user to, to take control of the, of the playback. So these three pillars are the, are the, are the core thing. 
in terms of functionality um, that is uh, that is guaranteed on the receiver and and controlled by the signaling from the from the broadcaster um, the receivers have the have uh, the burden to uh, guarantee the the minimum requirements uh, these six key points is is uh, the functional requirements and there are performance requirements as well as Carsten already told you there is um, there will be a certification scheme which involves third-party testing and uh, leads to a, a, a logo that is visible at the point of sale so consumers can decide for a receiver that is capable playing and and playing back this system and supporting the system and and such receivers will be guaranteed to have those functions uh, with the necessary minimum to play back the announcement messages in time in in times of alert and in times of emergencies um, the novel technique that enables the geofencing is is a is a technique that we call location code. It was developed in cooperation between the BBC and Deutschland Radio. Um, it's basically a hierarchical scheme of um, of 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 code um, to uh, to encode uh, WGS48 coordinates. This serves two purposes. One is to define an alert region in a set of such codes, in a set of uh, um, arbitrarily, arbitrarily show, chosen sized rectangles and a and receiver location in a, in a 30-bit code. So these two things come together with this, with this scheme. Um, very importantly for us is are the properties in the design. Um, it need to be universal. So um, any location globally and any alert region need to be encoded. There cannot be any region-specific mechanism. It's lightweight, so the the receiver side need to be um, uh, able to be implemented in a, in every entry class model. So there cannot be specific requirements on UI, memory, or CPU. <clears throat> and it's very efficient in that it's compact on transmission. So um, we have designed it in a way that basically any alert region can be encoded for for a transmission within a second to to the receiver. So there is no uh, significant wait time for for the uh, for the receiver to receive the the region definition. In uh, visuals, it looks like this. Um, on the on the left side, you see an actual alert region in Germany that was a heavy storm warning um, <clears throat> some time ago on the on the North Sea coast of Germany and on the right side you see the the, the a gridded pattern overlaid to that that is is not the the best encoding but it shows a basic encoding that that is feasible um, an optimization of the encoding will lead to a finer grained grained um, uh, representation it's just like to uh, to showcase the the encoding method and and this scheme and here are some examples from from asia to of, of different sizes also to showcase that uh, that the the uh, location code scheme can support encoding uh, alert regions of basically any size from small mud um, um, and road closures to earthquake warnings in indonesia um, a draft warning in Central Asia, and and finally on the right side of a heavy thunderstorm path, a cyclone path, crossing the uh, the the um, the, um, the Indian Ocean <clears throat> into into Africa. So let me move on. Though, how does the the system work? Um, as I already said, the key uh, um, technique is is a spoken message on the audio channel. So there will be a human sp sitting in a studio, uh, uh, telling, them, reading the 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 alert message, which usually consists of three parts: what has happened, where has it happened, and what is the instructions, what is the <clears throat> safety instructions to to um, to protect from that. Um, uh, these uh, this audio is uh, is accompanied in here shown in green by an alert signaling for the whole duration of of the audio on air <clears throat> and in the in the timeline 
um, we need to understand that uh, initially when when the signaling comes up receivers will generally be in sleep mode and there will be a certain wake up time required for the entire receiver population to switch into that <clears throat> and and start the playback so that is basically how how a single alert announcement works um, the receiver plays back this announcement switches to a sub channel retunes to to the ensemble and the sub channel that it's that it's played on um, for an alert situation you understand that um, there will be uh, there will be several phases for one there will be a, the initial announcement making um, making known the basic situation. Then this can be repeated, and over time the situation may evolve like um, uh, like in a, what we have regularly, like a, a, an incident at a chemical plant, the wind direction changes, um, and and the the distribution of fumes will change. So there will be updates to an to the alert situation, which each in itself can also have um, have have updates and rep repetition, and in the end there will be will be a cancellation <clears throat> uh, that uh, that users can receive to say, well, yeah, <clears throat> you can open your windows again or you're free again to um, uh, to uh, leave the house. Um, as I already said, uh, this is a, a simple uh, slide to show that um, this uh, an alert announcement will will be played back typically in a single service on a single ensemble, but the system can cooperate, and other ensembles that that have a different scope or a different uh, uh, um, distribution area can also switch receivers into that announcement. Yeah, so that it's not you. There is no need for all announcements and all services to play back an alert. In, in instead, the alert can be played back on a single service, um, on a single a, a single announcement, and other all receivers in the ecosystem will be will re, can receive signaling to 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 play back that that announcement of course always um you understand there is geofencing so only receivers receivers e evaluate the alert area and and only those receivers within the alert area will actually play that back so the the final thoughts are the ecosystem considerations uh, which can uh, consist of two sides the receiver side and the broadcast side basically the question is why should companies and broadcasters receiver makers and broadcasters um, <clears throat> enter into the system, um, provide the system to the end user. Um, so on the receiver side, receivers are certified. So uh, receiver makers go through the third party testing, obtain a certification license and put a logo on the receiver that is on the box that is, um, that is visible at the point of sales. So, and, and this logo guarantees the full functionality, both in terms of functionality and performance. And for broadcasters, um, it's optional, ensembles opt in. So that is, that is basically the mechanism. No broadcaster will be forced into it. Ensembles opt in. But once it's an ensemble is an, uh, advertises itself as an EWS emergency warning system ensemble, it needs to satisfy certain certain requirements and needs to play by the rules. Basically, um, obviously, ideal all ensembles are EWS ensembles in an ecosystem. But that is that is a, like a scenario, ideal scenario, and but the entire system will still work. <clears throat> very very well if if um, if not all ensembles but but a majority of ensembles but technically it all already works if there is only one national ensemble playing playing the the uh, emergency alerts that would conclude my presentation for now I apologize a little bit for the for the quick going through the the topics which each may be rather rather complicated and and may deserve more words and more discussion. But um, that should should be left to the to a Q and A session, and um, I'm also happy to 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 discuss more details um, um, as uh, if you contact me through through World Up or directly. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Andreas. A very interesting presentation and a very fantastic project in Germany, and let's hope we see. 
that propagate through to other countries very soon. It's being set up, <clears throat> pardon me, to um, be an international method. So that is good stuff. Look, we have a lot of questions. Uh, we've only got two minutes, but I think we just might have to tickle over time just a little bit. Um, I will try and group some of these questions uh, together somewhat. Uh, but for starters, I'm going to jump straight back into the last topic on emergencies and the method that um, uh, um, uh, Carsten and Andreas were talking about. And perhaps, uh, Andreas, you'd like to just tell me or tell the audience the answer to this question. For geofencing, will receivers need a, receive, a GPS receiver like it in smartphones and navigation systems? So when in traveling vehicles, the receiver will automatically change the appropriate area. Can you, um, you respond to that? Please? Yes, I can. I can respond to that. Um, that was a, a, a that was a point of substantial discussion and debate. Um, <clears throat> there are basically the technique and and the solution that we decided for enables receivers without GPS to join that system. But then the, a user that is for for stationary receiver, the user need to need to enter a location code uh, for for the receiver for the receiver location. Um, which method the, the, by which method this is entered is 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 open to the manufacturer. The, there can be a Bluetooth uh, application that transmits a code to the to the receiver or there can be a, a, a user interface method whatever uh, car receivers that already have GPS don't have that problem they can <clears throat> they can translate their position all the time and in real time uh, up to the minute uh, to to a correct location code so uh, that is uh, that uh, that is a very simple and and still very effective method to to have geofencing effectively enabled with with very high High resolution. You may notice that uh, <clears throat> the resolution of the of the receiver is is plus minus one uh, five hundred meters within a range of a kilometer, basically. Okay, good stuff. It, it's obvious that uh, you'd have to deal with that question, um, you know, quite seriously. It's a fundamental part of the operating of the of the overall system is knowing where you are. Um, there was another question here um, about where to find information about this project. Uh, and maybe um, it's a simple answer. It's um, deutschlandradio.com dot something. I don't know. It'd be good to um, have a reference point for people interested in this topic. I didn't. Did, was there one in the presentation? It is that we have uh, written a uh, management summary. It's all there in English, which on seven pages tells you the basic technology. And we are collaborating very intensively with WorldDub. And I'm quite sure that WorldDub will at some point um, uh, open a page and, and write down you know, what we're doing now. So uh, this is a start. And we have something to share. And after this day, I think we should have a little small section uh, regarding the progress for everyone to read. Uh, what can be uh, publicized and conveyed. Okay, we'll talk about the that within the, the World Dev team, how we can provide some links to that system to uh, foster understanding of how it works, uh, what's going on and how it can be propagated around the globe. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, let's move on. We've had a number of questions about receivers. So I'm just gonna go through a couple and then perhaps uh, uh, Patrick, you'd like to kick it off with some, some answers there. So we've got one from Boba Hooten, who's in Myanmar. Uh, how much will DAB receiver price for home use be in Asia region? Um, let me just continue uh, on this receiver topic. Also, DAB's major competitor in the world's first world country is streaming and podcasting on mobile phones. How do economic pollution compare with DAB Plus? I don't think that was the question I was trying to find. <laughs> um, there was one more. Oh, the smartphone question. Uh, what's going on with DAB in smartphones? Patrick, would okay. you like to yeah. give that a go? <laughs> um, okay, so, um, uh, well, first of all, on smartphones, um, there, there was a trial um, you know, probably about five or six years ago with LG. Um, but that didn't really, although you know, it, it was in one model, 
uh, but it, we've not seen anything more um, since then. So, so I think the short answer is at the moment, um, uh, DAB is not in smartphones. Um, there's no immediate prospect of that changing. Uh, number one, number two, on the price of the receivers. Um, okay, so FOB. Uh, so this is the price when the uh, when a uh, and this is uh, entry level prices. So when the when the product leaves the factory, it's about ten dollars. Okay. Um, and then, so then the question is, okay, so so then what is the retail price? Well, that really depends on the on the market uh, market you know, the conditions of any individual market. Um, but I think typically um, you you would expect it to be roughly twice the ten dollars. Okay, uh, so so twenty dollars, but you know, give or take. I mean, it, it could be less than it could be less than that, depending on um, how competitive the market is and what the retail infrastructure is. So, you know, so if you want a, a rough idea, it's about $20, but could be a little bit less. Um, and then the third question was uh, to do with the economics, um, just remind me, the, the rec economics and pollution. Um, the, um, I think the best, there's two, uh, yes, I don't, I don't have sort of all the numbers immediately in my head, but uh, on the economic side of it, um, the EBU has done a major study comparing the price of DAB with different di distribution mechanisms, uh, different different platforms, including uh, IP. Uh, so, um, so there so the, there are figures available there, um, and um, and really it depends. One one of the key questions is how many people are listening. You know, so with, with a broadcast platform, you basically you have your transmitter and then you send out the signal and it's essentially free to receive with ip every single listener um you know you know there's you know, there's a you know there's a micro cost associated with every listener who listens on ip you know for for the you know, for on the distribution side uh so depending on how many people you have listen uh then the question is um uh you know once you get to a certain scale then DAB uh, is, is is simply uh, much more cost effective than IP. But for more detail on that, uh, I, I'd recommend uh, the EBU report. Um, on the pollution side of things, um, well, the the en energy consumption is is the figure that's been looked at, um, and the BBC report uh, that um, that I mentioned, um, which yeah, I, I just gave you the figures for uh, comparing DAB to FM. And it was about a third. The energy consumption was about a third lower. And, and just to be clear, that includes both transmission and reception. Okay, uh, so that that report also looks at um, IP as as another uh, distribution platform. Also looks as a, a, a digital TV uh, for any, anybody who's interested in that. Uh, so, so I think the best thing to do would be to point people, and I've, I've, I've answered one of the questions in the chat, um, I've, get, I've given the link to that report, um, so all the detail uh, can be found there. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick, that's great. Um, let's switch uh, topics for a moment. Uh, I've got um, a couple for Dr. Adnan. Uh, the first one is a question about, uh, could please let us know if DAB Plus receiver is mandatory for new vehicles being sold in Arab world, especially Saudi. Did you get that question okay, Dr. Adnan? Uh, Dr. Les, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer the the question. I I I I, I like to leave to to Mr. Kamal Al Hajj to to answer this question if it is possible. Right. Okay. Leave that. Sorry. Leave that question to answer. I leave the, the answer to Kamal from uh, ONT Tunisia. He's, uh, oh, okay, okay, that, that's that's good. He's um, he's on tomorrow. Okay, so, so we'll we'll ask him then. So we do know that you have an ASBU receiver profile, which is good, and we know that uh, countries like Saudi Arabia has got some legislation of some sort. I'm not familiar with it uh, about receivers coming into the country. So. 
um, I think basically following the footsteps of the EBU with the EECC. So uh, that's always a good move because it helps things move forward quicker, gets more listeners uh, and more receivers in country. Okay, that's great. And the other question for you, Dr. Adnan, do you know what is going on in Egypt? Um, are they planning a trial uh, or other activities uh, in Egypt? Uh, uh, the last uh, questionnaire we made uh, and get uh, information from the Arab countries about implementation of the DAB, it was on uh, 2020. And we have in the fact uh, no new information about the situation. So personally, I, I don't have any information about what is going on in Egypt or I think I can offer a, a, a slight update and additional information. Um, World DAB has had conversations okay. that, that are not 100% confirmed, but we understand due to the extreme FM congestion that there is in Egypt, that there is or has been recently a, a DAB plus demo broadcast that has taken place and we've been in discussions about how to encourage receivers into the market in Egypt so there is certainly interest but um, specifics beyond that we would have to go away and try and find out straight from the stakeholders but there is definitely interest and some activity that's what we've heard okay great well that's that's good news I think that's good news that was a part of the map that was missing in my mind uh, then and that's been highlighted there's activity in Egypt that's that's great because that pretty well covers all the top of North Africa so excellent okay uh, just a couple more and we'll let you go we have some questions on coverage um I'm wondering Lindsay would you like to look at talk about that one uh, could you make comparison between DAB coverage and FM coverage on the same power transmitter I assume that means the same Um, <clears throat> thanks, Les. I missed just the end of of what was there, but I mean, let me let me just say a few words on this. Um, that there have been some comparisons that have that have been done, um, and it's always very difficult to put specific figures on anything. Um, one of the key issues is that on a DAB transmitter, uh, you will have multiple services, um, and that might range anything from 10 to 20. Uh, we've even seen 24, 25 services on a DAB ensemble. And all of that is coming from the same same transmitter. Um, there's a difference in the technologies. So FM uh, is a narrowband system and it can use a nonlinear uh, amplifier. So FM transmitters tend to have quite good electrical efficiency, uh, whereas DAB transmitters uh, have lower electrical efficiency, but they do require less power to cover the same area. So um, there's also a question about how broad is the signal. Uh, FM is a narrowband signal around 200 kilohertz wide, DAB one and a half megahertz wide. Um, so comparing like with like is not straightforward, but overall, as Patrick showed in his uh, uh, presentation, um, with some calculations that have been done, making certain set of assumptions, for example, I think the study that was shown is, was from um, Gates Air, uh, and it works on the basis of having 18 services uh, in the DAB ensemble, and it shows you that for the same coverage, um, the cost per service is very much lower. Um, so to do a comparison directly on the power of an FM transmitter, the power of a DAB transmitter. Um, if you said you want to, to uh, carry 18 services with FM, you would need FM, uh, you would need 18 FM transmitters. So this is this is where it's quite difficult to give an exact figure uh, because it depends on on the market. But the the sort of the the rough answer is DAB transmit. Uh, will, DAB will transmit the same program over the same area with a lot less power used um, per service. I hope that's useful. Thank, thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, and if you actually look at the ITU 
specifications and requirements or recommendations, you'll find that the, the field strength levels required for FM are actually higher than a lot of the requirements for field strength levels in DAB. And that's comparing um, a, a carry with 18 services or more with uh, a single single entity. So I, I recommend you have a look at the, uh, uh, whoever asked the question has a look at the ITU uh, specifications there. I've got an associated question here as well, one about Australia, in fact. And it says Australia has 50 kilowatt ERP transmitters at 200 metres. Uh, that sounds like Sydney. Um, uh, what is the typical effective coverage area? Well, here is a comparison that I can give you first-hand experience of. Um, that 50 kilowatts ERP in Sydney is actually 45, and it basically covers the Sydney Basin at vehicle-grade coverage. So that's about a radius of about 50, 60 kilometres to get out to the Blue Mountains. Now, the FM services run at 150 kilowatts ERP three times. They cover the same area plus a bit more. So what we can say roughly, roughly is I would say at the same power, there's not a great deal of difference. What you do find though, is you get different degradation with FM. FM has more graceful degradation, whereas DAB being digital has the advantage of error correcting coding to get more distance but it also has the cliff edge effect when you have too many errors. So um, hopefully that gives a few clues. Um, certainly have a look at EBU and ITU documents that will be uh, very helpful to uh, get a better understanding. Um, I think at this point, uh, we're almost 15 minutes over. There are a couple of other questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, but I'd just like to uh, say thank you at this point, thank you for your attendance. We had um, over 117 delegates to this event, a fantastic result. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow. Tomorrow is about equipment and how we get started in DAB broadcasting. We have some excellent speakers from industry and from experienced people in um, network operations and regulation talking about how to get started with DAB. So um, at this point, I'd like to thank all our panel. Uh, great job, everybody. Uh, thank you for answering the questions. Uh, thank you, the attendees, for asking the questions. It's a great response in the question. And if you didn't get your answer answer today, please uh, ask it again tomorrow and let's see if we can get to that. We have a list of them. So we can cross off the ones we did. <laughs> but for now, I'd say thank you very much. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow. So thank you and bye for now. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Okay, uh, let me also echo thanks from uh, Dr. List to all uh, speakers and uh, participants. So we have more exciting topics as uh, let's said. Uh, so tomorrow let's join again same time so see you all um, from abu from asbu and old app so thank you for your participation Bye.